In St. Benedict calls the hours of prayer that the monks have, he calls it, he uses the global term for that, the opus dei, uh, the, the work of God is, is how that translates. Uh, today the church calls the same thing the liturgy of the hours. Uh, St. Benedict doesn't use that term, although liturgy of the hours is a good way of naming what's happening. It's liturgy at different hours. St. Benedict's name is perhaps uh, hides a deeper reality of what's happening. At all the different hours of the day, the monks come together for prayer. And the idea is to, to sanctify that hour of the day. St. Benedict's arrangement is inspired by a line from one of the Psalms that he quotes in the Holy Rule, where he says, uh, seven times a day I praised you, O Lord, and in the night I rise to sing your praises. And so Benedict arranged these different hours of prayer, and that was a work. Uh, it was the work of God. You can understand it as a work done for God, but I said there's something hidden in the phrase. It's also a work that God does in the monks, and it's a work he does in the world through the monks, the various hours of the prayer. I like St. Paul's phrase for what my vocation as a monk is, what our vocation is, uh, where he says that, that you are called to the praise of God's glory. And so all these hours spread throughout the day, ultimately their origin is the praise of God. And we use the Psalms primarily as the, as the text of our prayer. We use the Psalms primarily, and the Psalms are full of praise, but uh, praise is accompanied by other uh, attitudes of prayer as well. When one comes into the presence of God, which St. Benedict says when monks are, are praying together in the choir, uh, they need to be mindful that they're in the presence of God. When monks come into the presence of God to sing His glory, we're immediately mindful also of our unworthiness to be there. We, we become aware in that presence of, of our sinfulness. And so prayer also is a plea for mercy and forgiveness. Uh, prayer also is a, is a plea for protection. Uh, prayer also uh, rejoices in being called to be in God's presence. It, it asks for strength to be faithful to God. It recounts again and again uh, before God the, that we know the wonderful things he's done for us. different hours of the day, the first hour of the day is vigils, and vigils is the most, uh, probably the most characteristic monastic prayer, because the whole church has the liturgy of the hours as a form of prayer, but the monks do it in a particular way. Vigils would be the most characteristic monastic prayer. Vigils is a prayer that takes place uh, on the cusp between night and day. It takes place in the early morning generally in this part of the world, while it's still dark. But the, the name Vigil tells us the essence of, of the spirit of this prayer, uh, because every day the vigils of the monk echoes the hour of the day in which Christ rose from the dead. Namely, uh, before dawn, uh, somewhere in the middle of the night, uh, Christ at an hour known to God alone, and with no one seeing it actually happen, Christ rises from the dead. So that time of day, in a sense, is sanctified forever. And monks begin their day in that time of day, in that place between light and dark, where Christ rises from the dead. And vigil also implies a lengthy prayer. So it's kind of a prayer in which one is waiting for this rising of Christ from the dead. Uh, every day begins, every day repeats for, for the Christian uh, the pattern of, of, of Christ's life. So that, in a sense, getting up in the morning 
is for the Christian, and the monks live this in an intense way, arising from the dead and having on our lips uh, uh, the, the praise of God. Vigils begins uh, at St. Benedict's instructions with the psalm verse repeated three times, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. So, but, but really, that's, that's almost it's like that's Christ speaking from the tomb. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. And that Christ prayer then is found in the monks. Christ's rising from the dead and the praise that is on Christ's lips to his Father when he rises from the dead. That's what's on the monk's lips for the rest of the day. Lauds is the first prayer after that. Lauds is, is the morning praise of the church. And Lauds takes place uh, just as the sun is rising, and depending on the time of the year, we do it Lauds at the same time every morning here. Uh, but uh, more or less as it's definitely going to be day. Okay? And so, it, and, the, and the mood of that prayer is a praise of God uh, as the sun is rising. And various of the psalms and the canticle, especially the gospel canticle we sing, uh, marks that, that prayer. The Mass is the, is the high point of the day of prayer. And we would say the Sunday Mass is the high point of the week of prayer. In some sense, Sunday Mass is, is the big moment of prayer in the week. Sunday, of course, is the, the day of the Lord's resurrection. In celebrating the Mass, we encounter the Lord's resurrection and our, and our share in it in a, in a particular, particularly strong way. And then what happens to us on Sunday in that premier kind of way is repeated every day uh, in, the, uh, in the course of the week. But the Mass is important because it's, it's, uh, it's Jesus' biggest gift to us. It's the memorial uh, of his death. Of course, we're repeating the supper that he gave us the night before he died. We repeat the supper at his command. And what the church discovered by being faithful to this command to repeat uh, the meal that he did, the meal in, during the course of which he took the bread and said, this is my body, and taking the wine, he, he said, this is the cup of my blood. By repeating that meal, Christians through the centuries have realized that they come in to the power of, his, of this hour, which is the hour in which he gives himself over to us. The actual historical Last Supper uh, was already a part of Jesus' dying. He was, he, was, he was saying, I'm going to death uh, on the next day, and I'm doing it for you. And so in that way, what, what we have discovered through the centuries in the celebration of Eucharist is that when we repeat this meal, we come into the hour of his going to death. And we share in that. And that's why we, the meal is also understood by the theological tradition to be the sacrifice, the sacrifice of his dying. And... Um, and when we remember his dying, it is then that we know him to be risen from the dead. I think that's an important connection. It's a deep one, but it's worth understanding because it, we don't proclaim Jesus' resurrection simply by saying he's risen. We don't experience him just by simply saying he's risen. Remembering his dying, we encounter him as the risen Lord. 
so that the one, so that we remember that uh, Jesus being risen from the dead doesn't simply vaguely mean, uh, well, I guess he's not dead anymore. What it means is that this one who went to death for our sake and was crucified for our sake has been raised up and is present now because he's raised up and is giving himself to us now and is giving us, giving himself to us now in this bread which has become his body and in this wine which has become his blood. This is huge. There's nothing bigger than this. So in some sense, then, of course, it's the center of the monastic day. Of course, it's the center uh, of monastic prayer. Uh, when we receive his body and blood, we enter into that hour of his dying and rising. And then we share in the power of his dying and rising. If we think of how that relates to the divine office, the praying of, of the liturgy of the hours throughout the day, it cannot not remember that. Of, of, of course, any other prayer takes place in the same place around the altar on which the Eucharistic sacrifice has, has been offered that day. We come to the same place and we recall that, or if you will, look forward to it. And so it's a kind of rhythm of prayer uh, with that, that central highlight that is there. Then we pray at noon, uh, when the sun is at its zenith. Again, what time of the day is it? That's why it's called Liturgy of the Hours. So now at a different, when the day has a different characteristic underway, we pray again. We come to that prayer, uh, not like we did the morning prayer. We come to vigils from bed, and we come to lauds from the extended vigils and the, and the Lectio Divina that we do before that. Instead, we come to the noonday prayer from work. And we're going to go back to work when it's over. So this is a prayer that's kind of going on in the heat of the day. And uh, maybe, we, maybe we really need help to get through the day. Uh, maybe we've fallen into temptation or sin uh, or a rough spot with one of the brothers. All of that uh, is meant to be uh, quickly remedied by the presence of God that we come into and we reconcile and and we can still sing his praises and ask his help for the rest of the day. Let my prayer arise, O Lord. Vespers is the evening prayer of the church when the, when the monk's work day is over. And it is, a, again, an extended praise uh, for what this day has been, uh, the, the, the sense of uh, working with God in his creation, working with other people. And now we want to finish that work day uh, before we go to supper. Uh, we want to finish that work day doing what we'd really want to do all day long, and that is praise him in this different hour of the day. And 
then the final hour of the day uh, is Compline. In uh, Compline uh, means our English word complete comes from it. It's closing of the day. And that's a night prayer. Um, and the night prayer is a, is a sense of uh, entrusting oneself over to God through the course of the night and uh, using, still always working with the hour. What time is it? Now it's dark. Now it's night. And of course, dark and night are a symbol of potential evil, potential danger, potential death. And so we let, we let the hour, we let the darkness remind us of these realities of our life. We almost use them as, no, we, we use them as symbols for our prayer. And we ask that in this night of danger, uh, we be protected in the night of this world that we be protected and that we can shut our eyes and enter into the defenseless space of sleep, uh, trusting that God will raise us in the morning. It's a, it's a beautiful prayer. And then after that prayer uh, in monasteries, uh, St. Benedict has uh, what he calls uh, the great silence. Uh, of, we practice silence all day long in the monastery, but uh, the night after, after the Compline prayer, the, the silence is, is absolute in the monastery. So that's a time monks go generally to bed shortly after Compline, but it's a time uh, of intense prayer and quiet with Christ, appropriate to the night.